working with like my idea of perfection. Like a lot of people say, nobody's perfect, nothing is perfect. That's completely untrue. Why is that? You think there is perfection? Of course. But it's, is it different to everybody what perfection is? Or what is perfection? See, that's the thing. Everybody's, everybody's, um, huh. is actually counting on or going off of a preconceived conception of what perfection is when you say nobody's perfect. So the simple thing is, it's really nice in here right now. Like, it's really nice. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. What is it? It's perfect. Right? It's yeah. water. Same shit. Someone else might come in and think, I wish it were 10 degrees cooler. Wouldn't be perfect for them. Exactly. You walk outside, same thing. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. There's a little bit of breeze. It's fucking perfect. You know, it's a perfect spring day. Well, then how can you not attain a perfection? So the thing is, so people, uh, artists, writers, athletes will work on something over and over again and, and maybe do it or think that it, it can't be perfect. And they'll stop themselves instead of saying it's perfect and move on. Once something's perfect, you don't do any more to it, right? It's done. It's perfect. Enjoy it. Move to the next thing. Find the balance, which is the perfection of all things. Boom. You've got it. So you just move forward. And sure, you can look back and stuff and go, oh, I could have done that better. Sure, you could have done a lot of things better with your life and with the art. But it was perfect at the time because you liked the feeling and it allowed you the freedom to move forward. There's a lot of people who say, I'm a perfectionist. I'm a perfectionist in right. this or I'm a perfectionist in that. Mm -hmm. Is everybody a perfectionist? Uh, I, I, I kind of feel like a lot of people say they're perfectionists are very just detail oriented people. And they don't and they're also task oriented people and they don't let go of uh, the task until all the boxes are checked. A lot of people who say I'm a perfectionist never are able to achieve perfection in their own minds, I think. And that, that could also be something that drives you forward. Um, and so I would never say I'm a perfectionist. I'm, I'm an artist and I really love creating. I love collaboration a lot because um, it brings out the best in everyone. But I love being able to move forward and let go of something after a point. Or else you'll become so fixated and never be able to evolve in what you're doing, whether that's photography or anything else. Whatever art, as an artist, yeah. if you if you look at yourself, and especially if most of your life has simply been you enjoying your art and maybe a few other people, mm. you haven't really marketed yourself per se. And I'm on that fence because I have and I haven't. It's, I've had a fair amount of publicity and whatever. But um, you, you got to believe in yourself that uh, it's not done the work is done but you're not done as an artist okay okay because what i've done <laughs> over the years is looked at plenty of photographers work plenty of i mean exhibitions out of my way books hung out with photographers because i was inspired by their work and, and eventually brought some of that into my own work and i noticed that uh, a lot of them especially the successful ones they made their money and enough money to retire whenever they retired and then the photographs they made kind of reflected the life they were living when they were done they were done they had this thing of i'm being done and in, in america it, it once you pass a certain age you're supposed to be done right mm. or once you stop a, a, an original project that you're it, you're done you're over there's a retirement age yeah you know, or you're having retrospectives and you're focusing more on something else you know you know we've talked about before how you're going to create what you want to create and there's going to be people who appreciate that or they connect with what you're doing. And there's some people who aren't. But these people who have made a living off of doing what they love to do and doing their art, is it because they are conforming to what they think people will buy or they're doing something that they love and it just so happens that people connect with what they're doing because they're doing it well or they have the passion for it? Years ago, I was working with a director Helen Ross, I can't remember his name actually, but uh, forgive me, his first name was Alan and he had done a lot of stuff and, uh, and he had done a couple films and one of the films was with, I think John Candy or somebody like that or somebody had a really bad cocaine problem on the film and you know, they kind of had to scrap the film and that kind of screwed his career. But anyway, um, he had been successful up to the point. I asked him why, how, curious, because I was really just working 
as a you know second cameraman dude anyway and he, he talked for a while and he goes uh, I knew my audience and so what I was creating was what they wanted because they were me I knew I knew who they were and I met this other guy through John Long I did this uh, slide presentation for my first book the Stone Masters like 2009 I think and John Long had taken this guy up because John was writing a script for someone or other. This guy's name was Lewis, and he was like the executive producer on um, Rambo, First Blood, and a bunch of other like low-budget, high-yield, cool films. And I said, Lewis, what do you do? Because this guy was very particular, and he seemed to like me because I swore a lot. And uh, because I'm a numbers guy, and I go, well, what exactly does that mean? He goes, all right, I'll break it down for you. Because somebody comes to me with a script, I can tell you how long it's going to run on the screens, how many screens are going to see it, what age group is going to go to it, how much it's going to cost to produce it, how much will it cost to promote it, how much it will it cost for every part of this film. And I can come up with a number. How much are you going to make? How much is, you know, and I go, oh. so if you, he goes, if you ever need someone like that, see me. I haven't had use of them yet, but now I understand how, especially with uh, filmmaking, which is the world's most expensive art project, hmm. and how things are parsed in a commercial world, yeah. actually, things you actually can see, everything costs money to produce. What I did with, with my thing was I kept myself at a level that you know, not a lot of people are going to buy Stone Nudes calendars. Not a lot of people are going to buy these books. Not a ton of people are coming to this museum. I make enough to keep doing that, and then I'll move on to this other thing, whatever that might be. You know, I call it separation of church and state. We've been talking a little bit about that, and that was kind of like, in my case, it was making your relationships part of your art, whether they be friendships or lovers. And that's kind of how I've always worked. Once again, perfection, uh, balance, and, and, and most importantly, closure and peace that allows you as an artist to, one, understand when the project you're on is done. I came across your writing. I, I learned, oh, can we give a big background, a little yeah, bit of yeah, background yeah. on who you are first? <laughs> I've <laughs> been sitting here talking about I work life at this here. gas station. Man. <laughs> Dean Fidelman, thank you for joining on Nick's Vancast, by the way. Uh, man, I, I learned about you many years ago from watching that incredible film that you were part of, Valley Uprising. That was at a time when I was pretty new to climbing. Mm -hmm. And there was something about just seeing what you guys did in you know the 60s, 70s, 80s, the whole time that they really spoke about in the film that really resonated with me. And it was something about just the freedom that you guys had to create, the freedom that you had to climb and seeing your images in this movie really inspired me to like, you know, chase after living that, you know, dirtbag existence in Yosemite. And so I dated this girl for a short time and we would go to Yosemite and, and sleep in the rocks and stuff. And you were obviously an inspiration to me as well as so many others. Can you give us a little background on, on how you, a little bit of how you started photography, but really when you started coming to Yosemite and how your art really was shaped around this, this place in this time period? Um, yeah, I, I can actually what it, it originally happened when I was in high school, it would have been 1971 or 72, I believe it was 70, 71. Uh, I was taking a, a high school photography class and they had electives, elective assignments. And one of them was take the take photographs of rock climbers at Stony Point. Up to this point, I'd never heard anything about rock climbing. I think I'd seen the Warren Harding had climbed the El Capitan in 1970, the Don Wall, and I'd seen that in the LA Times or something. So it kind of piqued my interest. So when he mentioned rock climbing, I was like, huh, Stony Point's about 10 miles from where I was. Uh, at that point, I was probably about 14 or 15, by the way. So I pedaled my bicycle after school out there. And there's these climbers, you know. And uh, I looked, and there was this one climber, and it was a girl woman 
But for me back then, it was a girl and she was climbing with no rope. And I thought, wow. So I scampered up behind her, got to the top of this rock and asked her how to get down. It was pretty much the same way we went up. <laughs> but I remember thinking, uh, climber Stony Point, I remember thinking that she'd be amazing to have, to have a photograph of nude. But you know, at that point, mm, I didn't know a whole lot about women or a whole lot about photography. I, could, I probably knew a whole lot about neither, more than I know now. And uh, I didn't do that 20 years later, I would. But uh, that was kind of my inspiration. And and I we became friends kind of, she was obviously older than me, and um, but she showed me climbing and introduced me to some people. And then eventually I ended up meeting John Backer and uh, John Long and, and Tobin Sorensen at Suicide Rock and becoming a, a stone master and um, and then sort of drifting off from climbing for a little bit and then coming back in, in the late 90s, mid to late 90s and hanging out with Dean Potter and, you know, Timmy O'Neill and Jose Pereira and you know, a lot of people from that time period as well. The, the Stone Monkeys is what we called ourselves. It kind of ended, you know, right around 2009 when Evo enough left Yosemite uh, and, and in the year 1999 I started a calendar called Stone Nudes and that was uh, women bouldering nude uh, and sometimes soloing things uh, throughout the world. The photographs ended up being it was a 20 year project that I ended in 2019 and in between that period I published uh, four books about the history of climbing kind of uh, stone masters was 2009, followed by um, the first Stone Nudes book, and then followed by um, The Valley Climbers, which is, you know, from the 80s till the 2000s. And then from uh, there, I went to uh, Yosemite in the 50s. Then the last book was Stone Nudes again, second volume in 2019. And then in 2019, I found myself kind of homeless because you don't get a lot of money to publish a book these days. Uh, especially books like mine that ended up only selling 500 because they were uh, released in the middle of a pandemic. So in 2019, Ken Yeager, who had been collecting artifacts for his uh, for a, a dream he had about a museum of climbing here in Mariposa, California, uh, gave me a call and said, hey, if I get a printer and some stuff, would you come here and help me make this museum happen? And I said, sure. And so I, I got here in like December of 2019 and uh, we started working on the thing in, in January and making cases and in February things were going. And then in March of 2020, uh, the world stopped. 2020 was a really interesting period in my life. But that's kind of like what my, my background in history is. Uh, I, I've always lived in uh, between Joshua Tree and, and Yosemite. Um, but I go to Colorado. I've gone all over, especially for the Stone News, but for climbing, I've followed climbers all over the world and made straight up climbing photos, not, not just nudes, also portraits. Lots of, some of them celebrity climbers, some of them just, you know, friends. Yeah. <laughs> they happen to be celebrities, I guess. I don't know. I've wasted a lot more time not making photos than I have making photographs. More time living, I guess, having a quality of life. I mean, it's cool that you have these photographs to yeah. look back on moments in your life and the lives of your friends. And at the time when you were making photographs with the Stone Masters in the mm -hmm. 70s, I mean, did you foresee that this was going to be a moment in time that people look back, a lot of people look back and are so inspired by the climbing and the photography? Or was it just you were having fun with your friends? Yeah, you see, not a, yeah, I didn't think, I wasn't thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you don't at a certain age, but because you're so living in the present and you can't imagine aging 40 years and what the world's going to be like. So I, you know, I had no idea, but I was making these photos and I knew the, the photos were good because I knew my audience, right? And I knew it then and there because Backer dug on it and Yabo dug on them and Michael Klinsky dug on them and Bridwell dug on them and everybody, you know, was digging on the stuff. And I also, you know, at the same time, I curate a lot of photos from my books and collect these images. So I knew who else was making photographs and I can be just as psyched about a photograph George Myers made in 1978 than I can on a photograph I made you know, two days ago in 2001. Um, even though I have all this background to do this, it was just, you know, it's like looking at the lines, looking at the beauty of it, the authenticity of it, I suppose. 
still turns me on. Uh, that's where I get my inspiration by looking at things, not by turning my head away and allowing my ego to blind me. So I know I, what, what is my friends dug the photos and I was working at a photo lab during the week printing and processing film. So I remember every Monday morning I'd be in there and uh, I'd, I'd put the film in the developer, take it out. And then I put the film into the stop bath and, and then reach into the stop bath and all my gobies and stuff, you know, from bad technique would just sizzle in that stuff, right? I was like, ah, and they go, what's going on in there? I'm like, nothing. Then I put it in the hypo, which is like basically salt water, the fixer. Ah, and they're like, what's going on? I'm like, just cleaning my wounds, mother <laughs> leave me alone. Um, so my stuff would go first. And, you know, I, I would print it and bring it out the following weekend. People are psyched and they want me there. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a great climber. I was a good climber and I had a lot of fun. I did my soloing and stuff and hung out with my friends and made photos. That's what my contribution was. That's how I expressed myself. They were expressing themselves by being at the top end of climbing. Hmm. And, and so my vision became their vision. When they saw a photograph, a climbing photograph in their head, it was something that I would have produced or did produce at the, you know, in the end. And, and in the late nineties that also transferred over to the stone monkeys, you know, what had happened was I'd gotten, um, at some point in the eighties, I'd gone to New York and tried to make it as a commercial photographer. I went to Europe and, you know, had a series of love affairs and models and this and that and doing fashion photography and went back to LA and was working, trying to make music photos and it didn't feel right. And one day out of the blue, Lynn Hill gave me a call. Dean, what are you doing? I go, oh man, living in a apartment, in uh, a loft in downtown LA and making photographs in dark hallways. And she says, that doesn't sound like fun. She goes, why don't you meet me in San Francisco, pick me up and take me to the valley, take some photos of me. I'm like, all right. So I went up there, picked her up and went to the valley, had a really fun time, um, met a bunch of people. I realized that I should go back, back. And, you know, the first couple nights, man, I was sleeping where I shouldn't be, you know. And I finally figured out the OB camping thing. And then um, I was befriended by a member of SAR who allowed me to put my tent in front of his cabin. He goes, I don't want to see you going in. I don't want to see you going out. I go, no problem. I come in late. I go early. And, and slowly met the monkeys and realized this was a cool thing. And these people were cool people. And I wanted to make my same photos. And I continued to do that and continue to show them the work. And that work started to get published because at that point there was publishing for, you know, there was a structure for climbing photos. So early on, I was working with 510. I was working for Real. I was working climbing magazine. I was working, you know, all this stuff from my stone master days when they wouldn't publish the photographs. Now they wanted to publish the old stuff and the new stuff. At some point, like really right around 1999, I, I was like, hey, I, if I really want to make money in this, because I could see there was some climbing photographers making bank, you know, not bank, but they're working all the time and they're all over the place, all over the world and stuff. And I'm still like the stoner doesn't want to leave the valley. It's hanging with my friends, you know, in the winter I might go Moab or Joshua Tree, but still I'm trying to, I'm trying to stay hungry in a way and be lazy at the same time. And, you know, I'd always made nudes when I, when I stepped away from, from climbing photography for that period of time, I, I, I did make a lot of nudes because a lot of my work, my creative works, especially centered around my lovers. Whereas maybe the work you're doing in a New York studio of a blender or toaster isn't as appealing. You, you need to actually make images that matter to you in the moment. No one was going to buy those images because they weren't for sale. And so same thing I did with the Stone Master, same thing I did with my life. You know, it's like, uh, I'm actually expressing something with my photography and this is why I'm giving it to you. This is why you're a part of it. The stuff that people paid me to do, unless it was of friends, I could kind of care less because of my connection was to money. And there's nothing wrong with that money and nothing wrong with being motivated by it and getting better because of it and going places you'll never go if you don't. Missing opportunities that should happen because you refuse to be successful. And I wasn't refusing to be successful. It's almost like the whole perfection thing and the, that definition. It was enough. There was just enough and I needed to stay hungry and move forward and I came up with stone nudes. Kind of fell on hard times for a little bit because you know, you, part of it, stone nudes is original work. It's an original body of work. 
right? And um, any artist wants to make original work. And, and most artists don't know when to stop making original work. And what happens when you do stop making original work? Are you going to make more? Mm. Do you have a history? I mean, I kind of have a history of it with the Stone Master stuff is kind of original. And then there's stuff in between. You'll see it's original. But Stone News is its own thing. Stone Monkeys is also kind of original. But you don't really see that as much as, you know, in your self-validation. Sure. Because if you're hungry, it means you're not validating yourself quite right. Something that I appreciate about your photography is, you know, they say pictures are worth a thousand words. You know, when, when you look at your photographs, you really do feel transported to a time. And of course, you'll never really fully understand what it was like to be there. But you get a piece of that, right? Mm -hmm. But you, I, I really appreciate about what you're doing is that you take it a step further in, and you've been making these beautiful prose and, and writing about these images and these times in your life. Mm -hmm. uh, how is that connected to the photography for you? And, and when did you decide to start writing the stories and the moments of making a photograph? You know, like forever, what I, 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 I've always told people, like, once again, this is how I express myself to the people in the photographs. And, and I always kind of felt that they understood. But then the work started becoming published because you're only making what you're making, but people still like what you're making and they'll publish it. I thought even, you know, with Stone News seemed to me to be misunderstood by a lot of people. Because, you know, people give me feedback, whether you ask it or not. Mm. Once you do something that people know about, oh, he does stone nudes. People love to say, you know, I'm in a group of people. And then someone likes to make me uncomfortable and mention who I am. And I'm like, because someone's going to have to say something. And I'm going to have to say something. And I don't want to say anything because I already said it with, with what I do and who I am, I think. But people will ask and, um, and I'll answer, you know. And, um, but it's like. You, you, you only have to be susceptible to self-criticism and that's honest. Honest with your, be honest with yourself about what's going on. Be educated enough with what's around you to know where you are. There's always gonna be someone better, more talented, more gifted, younger, prettier at whatever it is you do. Understand that. Uh, the, that was the other thing with Stone News. I was the best figure in a landscape, nude photographer, while I was doing that in the world. Because I defined the genre. Sure. And redefined the genre of nude in the landscape, English pictorial, rock climbing photography. A lot of stuff is mixed in there and popped out in there. Look at the photos, they're immaculate. Some of them are just so beautiful. And they really ended up after 15 or so years, I just started working on a feeling so a lot of times my cropping wasn't so accurate in the camera, which you like to try to do if you're a quote unquote perfectionist. But I realized what happened was I just kept looking and looking and trying to find the feeling when it was right, mm. then hit the shutter. And, um, and I've continued kind of that in, in a lot of different directions, just exploring how I see things in the world and how the camera sees things. But yeah, you know, you, you get outside influences, you get criticisms, you get a, a lot of stuff, you don't make a lot of money. Um, some people see it, some people don't. Uh, it depends on where you want your ego to go. And, and you know, oh, you never sold out, you haven't sold out. And I was like, no, I probably sold out a million times, but you know, either I covered it up or maybe it wasn't really a sell. -out. I don't know, I don't know, it's not me. And at a certain point in my life, when I was 50 or something like that, I was like, it. I just want to do what I want to do. Right. No one's going to hire me to do shit. You better, you know, eat. Yeah. When you're doing these photographs, when you're doing nude photography, I feel like often, especially in today's world, things are, things can be misunderstood. Do you find that yeah. your work in, in Stone Nudes is often misunderstood? Everything is over-sexualized and people don't always understand what you're trying to do. Stone Nudes had a, 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 like a short reach, was never promoted beyond a certain thing. When it did get promoted, 99% of the feedback that I saw or received was very positive. And one or 2% is not gonna be so positive. But today's culture, you know, uh, I, it, there's nothing here to get canceled about. And, th and that's the thing. There's even someone who really doesn't like or feels that nudes are exploitive can look at this and see that there's a partnership going on. 
you know, I've done slack line nudes and nudes in the environment. I mean, I've done that. You can see this energy there, even if you don't like me. Like a lot of times people don't like me and then they see the work. Uh, you know, they've stacked their emotions in the sense that they don't like that guy. So anything that comes out of that person, because for whatever reason, and, and once again, uh, you know, I try to use those four agreements. You, you say exactly what you mean. You, you don't take anything personally. You don't assume anything and you always try your best. Hmm. And, um, um, and always trying your best is self-defined as to what you really feel. You know, I know if I'm phoning it in and hmm. it's my life. If right. I'm making photos within my life, Alfred Stieglitz says, you know, you can have a photographer or an artist can have, you know, go through their entire career and never leave their garden, never leave their home. My taste is not for everyone. Why do you think that is? Because there's, you know, these huge publications like Climbing Magazine, and obviously so many of your photos are so iconic. What do you think it is about? Do you think it's just a, a certain type of person who doesn't fully understand? It's these high up executives at these Climbing Magazines who don't understand art no no they do they they actually do what it is is hey look they have to fill content every month mm. and, and lots of it and so my content it, they go past that but and, and uh, this professional climbing and and marketing teams behind this and um and you know they know what they know their audience and in a sense, I know mine, and I just have that smaller reach, mm. smaller audience in a way. So, you know, I, I, it's kind of the blues. So, you know, the thing with the writing, so what happened there was, you know, I, I, I uh, was not a good English student. I didn't write. That's surprising. <laughs> and I, I wrote letters now and then, but I think they were horrible. I even tried poetry, and it was probably just rhymes. So, anyway... Uh, when I, I made the book with John Long, 2009, The Stone Masters, and um, I wrote something for that, a, a thing that happened with Yabo soloing this thing naked. Like he was around, we were all around a fire, it was really cold, and uh, Yabo was there and he had no money, he had no weed, nothing. And uh, we managed to convince him uh, that if he took off his clothes, right by the fire and then ran over and did solo North overhang, which is, you know, all the way down at the end of the campground, five, nine in the dark, naked. And then down North overhang, we would give him weed, money, food, clothing, and our best wishes. And so he does this, you know, anyway. Uh, and I wrote this thing and John Long edited it and it seemed like in the end it, it sounded, uh, bless you John, a little bit more like John than myself, which was good because I knew my writing was bad. And, you know, when Instagram came around and um, I think really what happened was uh, Dwayne Raleigh over at Rock and Ice wanted to do a Stone Master thing and he goes, he, I think John was supposed to write the captions for the photos, but John was busy or something. Dwayne said, you go ahead and do it. And so I, I wrote these really sterile captions. And he, and he came back at me and goes, no, I mean, do something like, you know, this. And he just gave me th three or four lines of who somebody was. And I go, oh, I can do that. It's almost like poetry in a way. You have these little fragments if you know the person, but I knew everything about the time I made the photograph. And so I would give these fragments in, in these captions and then that kind of evolved into the, the, you know, what it was like for me in the moment to make the photograph and what my relationship to that person in the photograph was. And a lot of times my relationship to the person and what I'm talking about in the story isn't necessarily what's in the photograph or it's a photograph of, but it is of that person and uh, something intense that, you know, triggered a reaction to me about how I'm connected to them and why I was there and what it felt like to be there. And, and so it really started to work. And, uh, and I've kind of expanded on that. And, and my next project, one of my next projects is to make a book of my photographs, sort of an autobiographical retrospective of my career in life and, and uh, up to present times. And with these, this poetry and with the prose and, uh, 
a lot of people uh, have come up to me and they go, you know, I, I've always liked your, your photography. And now that I read these words, and there's nothing over 500 words, hmm. right? I mean, my longest story will probably be 1,200 maybe, but Instagram, you don't get even 500. But, so, but most of them will be 500, a little bit over around there. Uh, they go, now that I can read the, the story, it's genius. You know, they go, they, they really work. And I'm like, um, wow, you know, well, thank you. And, and you know, I'm a self-taught writer. So I know my tenses and all that stuff is wrong. I don't, I'm even not sure what a tense is, but somebody who was a writer said, yeah, you know, your tenses are wrong, but I love your writing. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> they go, you're the best storyteller I've ever met. But I remember everything in a way that seems compelling to people. And, and there was a compelling reason for me to pick up that camera because, you know, I was probably just as happy to pick up a reefer, 50-50, whatever. I mean, man, when I'm looking at your words, there's, I can't even remember, the, I can't remember the full thing, but, you know, you talk about the metal of the camera against your face. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, you're talking about, you know, a day spent with your friend. And it sometimes ends with, we made the photograph. Mm -hmm. It's like just this like punch at the end that just really maximizes the the event or the the feeling and and you obviously aren't going to get the full effect of what you experience but yeah there's something about that you're able to convey to people what you were going through or where your mind was when you made a photograph and it was a moment in time yeah and i think the the, the where i first started to really fix myself with that was um you know, I always wanted to make this book about one person and, and the idea was a lover, but you know, it ends up being like a tribe or two, a, you know, a group of people or two. So I started to distill these relationships, but I had this thing, I had, a, I wanted to make this book about one person and I, I had a person in, in mind and I talked to her about it and I said, you know, it's about love. And so it's almost like dating in a sense, but it's not, but we fell in love and I made this, I uh, remember when I, as we were just falling in love, I, I made a stone nude of her on the beach in Santa Cruz. And I had made stone nudes there before, and I made a really cool photograph of Chris Sharma. So That's a lot of a the stone photo. nudes, yeah, thank you. A lot yeah. of the stone nudes come from these photos of, of uh, really good climbers, you know, and I'll, I'll make them in the same location. But the thing with Chris was kind of cool because it was a full circle thing. The Panther Beach Yeah, the photo. Panther Beach photo. Incredible photo. Yeah, beautiful photo, and everything just lined up like it did. And, um, but once again, I was at, in Santa Cruz with the writing and I knew I was going to uh, make photos and write because this basic concept was based on Alfred Stieglitz and Georgia O'Keeffe and they wrote thousands of letters between them. And so I started with emails and on this first attempt or subsequent attempt, whatever, in 2018, the, the intent was there. We we're going to make this book. And I was making these photographs and talking to her about the book at the same time. And... I'm on the beach and I know since it's Panther Beach that the waves are gonna come up. Uh, so I knew to roll up my pants, you know? And I remember as I made the photograph, the wave came up a little higher and I could feel the sand leaving my toes and the water was hitting the bottom of my cuffs because then I knew they were not low, you know, they were too low. And at the same time, everything lined up in the camera and I hit the button. I remember that because normally you, you're gonna move away or, or go up in your tippy toes, but everything was perfect. So I just made the photograph. Like once again, I always look for the balance in everything. And within balance, you find the beauty. I think some people don't always do that or whatever, but I'm always looking. So when you make a portrait, you just sort of move the person a little bit, manipulate slightly to get them to look balanced in the camera and to feel like they can give you something more behind the eyes than in front of the eyes. Just, you know, you're not asking for that, but a, a certain way of, of like, you know, if you were giving someone a massage and you're working their shoulders and their head, and oh, so what you're doing is you're trying to find a posture and an attitude and everything within that person that allows for a balance, either inner or outer, both of them together is great. And, and you make that photograph then. Uh, also the reason why I use the term make and create and collaborate 
in a few other terms is because I kind of rejected the, and this was taught to me by Ansel Adams, actually. Uh, he says, no, you don't, you don't shoot a camera and you don't take a photograph and you don't capture anything. And I realized, one, they're kind of these weird male-centric terms that work with firearms, but not with cameras. Things go into cameras. They don't necessarily come out of NSA in the same way. And so I prefer to create with people and collaborate with people. I prefer to make photographs and, and create art. And so I look at things in those terms. If I want to feel like the artist that I think I am, the words I use to describe myself, the, the human beings I work with, the environment that I live in, that's all a part of these things should be of the utmost respect and in the terms of each of those individual things. I noticed that immediately when I started looking at your work was we made the photograph. Mm -hmm. And you don't hear that often. It really does stick out as opposed to let's go shoot or mm -hmm. let's go take a photo. It's making art. Yeah. And that's special. Yeah. If it's something you really love and you're passionate about, I, I would I would use those terms. Right. Um, and so I do. And when I talk to people, I, I use the terms. I don't all explain why I do, but they, they pick it up really quickly. Yeah. And, and I don't chastise someone for not, you know, saying it in, in that way. It, it, once again, it's all about your approach to life if you're a lifer. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Something that also sticks out about your writing is that as you talk about that moment on the beach where the water is hitting your pant legs and somebody told me before, whether it's creating videos or creating photographs, they're subjective in a way because just as much as is in a photograph, you know, you're also leaving something out of the frame. Definitely. And so how important is it for you to, you know, write words or captions with these photographs? Are you trying to convey the things that are left out of the frame? Or is it more to convey the story and the emotion behind what you were feeling? A lot of times it's, you know, what's left out of the frame because there's a, there is a backstory to everything. And, and that's kind of like what I like to extrapolate. But also I'm a participant in that story in whatever way in, in those moments. And so that's kind of what I'm trying to distill there. And so it brings a lot of people right there. I think for people that could have been in front or can be in front of my camera, it brings them to that point. Mm -hmm. For, for uh, others, artists and photographers, it brings them to the other point that they also know about, they've also felt. When people write and bring themselves into a story, it always ends up being about them I always let everybody know that we're crafting an image, but also I, I, I have a tendency to focus a lot on the physical things that happen. A little bit of wind blows my hair in front of the viewfinder. I blink my eyes and my hands are sweaty. I wish I could chalk them. I'm looking, you know, and then I'm describing the action above. So I'm describing how I'm feeling in that moment and, and in a really physical sense that everyone has probably experienced. And, you know, emotions are physical, mm. right? They, they don't have a factual existence in, in a sense. They're, they're triggered by memories, which are something that happened. And then with love, you know, a lot of it's written after the end of the, the relationship. Some of it's written when it is happening as well. Um, and a lot of that comes in fragments once again. But I know where I was. I know where I felt. I, you know, I know I was that night sleeping down by the river with my lover because it was so hot and we were alone on the sand because Yosemite was closed, you know. But the photographs that I made that day or the day after are going to be there because that's all part of the journey to get to those images. And I'm trying to shift my focus currently away from my photography as a main thing into my writing as a main thing. Mm. And that's been really difficult. I haven't really achieved either right now. Like I'm blocked in photography in a sense that I'm trying to shift over into this writing thing that's I haven't th the discipline to do because I'm too old to figure it out. So when I say writing is difficult for me, it means it's challenging and it's being hard and I hate it. And when it works, you can't believe the inner peace it gives me. And so I try to bring that into everything. Really work hard to get 
your balance. I love slacklining because of that. Balance comes nat naturally and flows, right? Right. But if you get too upset on a slack line, you fall. Well, I do say. You That's know. what the writing does for me, too. Right. It's, it shows me what I'm lacking. <laughs> okay. I like that. <laughs> and, what I, when I, and what I possess. Right. But, you know, like you say about, you know, knowing your tenses and things, you're really just relating your experience. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I think you're so aware that you know, doing something hard and it may suck in a moment, but it's like when you, when it clicks and when you get it, like nothing, nothing worth it is really ever easy. Right. No, that can be writing. That can be anything. So that's something that I think is really important for people to know. It's not just doing things that you're good at immediately, mm -hmm. but doing something that may be hard, knowing that it's going to make you a better artist or a better person. Yeah, and it, it and it's funny too because of of we're humans, and when you put stuff out there, whether it be on Instagram or a magazine or what have you, you are now open for criticism. And I've gotten nothing but positive criticism and compliments for the writing from most everyone, from a lot of writers and editors who will work with me and. Um, but there's one writer who's influenced me and I've made all my books with, and I asked him if he would take a look at some things that I had because I don't think he was on Instagram at the time. He might be not, but I don't think he follows me. But anyway, I said, I want to send you a few pieces to have this idea for this book. And, uh, and I sent him a few pieces and, uh, and uh, I never heard anything back because I know that my work is really different than his you know we've made like uh, five books together and so you want that feedback from that person yeah but but in the books there was always a, a kind of a stark division of responsibilities mm. mine has always been the visual mm. end of it and um, the design and I always generally work with the designer and, and see it through to the very end because I, I'm that kind of an artist I like making Right. Well, collaboration is so important too. Yes, for me it is because it's all about that. Collaboration. Yeah, I, I'm, I suck at landscapes and stuff and, and wildlife, pet photography, wedding photography. I can't do any of that. Fashion, I'm okay at, but not really. This stuff, whatever that happens to be. And the most recent stuff, which was that in, in, in March of 2020, I the world came to an end. The actual world actually slowed down. The vibration of the world was different because of the lack of airliners and cars and ships. And it allowed me, in a sense, to make a collaboration with um, a woman. Together, we wanted to make a book in the same vein as um, Stieglitz and O'Keefe. We wrote a lot of letters to each other about how things would be before we met. And then when we met, we made a lot of photographs and had a pretty intimate relationship for a year. At the end of the year, she uh, uh, left. When the mask came off, she left. We made a bunch of photographs. We made a bunch of texts, uh, photos with our phones. She's an artist, a beautifully talented artist. Made a lot of watercolors and drawings and also a beautiful poet. I always celebrate an end of an affair by my body breaking down in some way, my back going out or headaches or and this one, I ended up in the hospital on the emergency surgery table. It was in there for three, four days. and was kind of touching the end of my life in a way. I kind of felt that. Because I realized I had stacked everything that happened in a way I'd always done that was always going to lead to this. And understand the reason why this whole thing happened was because my friends, they just died like... Uh, you know, Stanley died, Jose died, Roberta died, Charles Cole died, um, you know, uh, uh, Backer died. Uh, they all died on me. Uh, then Dean died in 2016. And I had nothing but stone nudes, and so I ended it a couple years beyond that because there was so much death all of a sudden 
that I ended Stone Nudes and I didn't know what I was going to end up doing. And I, you know, drifted until I came to this place and now I'm here. And I know that will end at some point, just like this relationship with ended and all those relationships before have ended in this new beginning, this new opportunity in life. And, and with this switch of becoming this writer, hopefully a narcissistic one, mind you, because I'm writing about myself, but beyond that, uh, hopefully I, I, I give honor to the people and the friends in the images as well that I write about. But in this moment, I'm choosing to stack the odds in my favor, continue to attempt to make original art and art that pleases the people, the audience that I know, uh, maybe expand upon it a little bit. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I've chosen to look at things like the, the relationship ended because the art ended as it should have, and it's complete until we get to the point where we want to present it, and then you do another journey, but together or separately. Uh, and, and looking back at all these other journeys that I've made with all these people, friends and lovers, stone masters and stone monkeys, you know, then a lot of the stone masters have been dying, you know, and so your, your oldest friends, even though they might not get it, they got it, and they go. Um, and, and so and in order to free yourself, in order to free myself, I, I look at everything as I'm getting this closure, I'm moving forward, I'm transforming myself and my art, uh, and I'm scared as hell, right? I'm going to end up in what? My van living in Yosemite down by the river. Uh, there's nothing to be frightened of there. There's not a, 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 a ghost or two might haunt you, but beyond that, there's nothing that's going to throw you you can live out your life walking in the slack line, making random photographs and doing a climb now and then. There's nothing wrong with that because you're going to end up down there by the river anyway because you want to be. And it allows you to be in the same place and let go of the emotions that might hold you back and stop you from creating your best self and your best life. You manifest the life around you. It's so apparent and so difficult to understand how you let go of all that and manifest the life you want you know you, you just if you love your life if you love the people in your life that means your friends and your lovers almost as equally in a way with all your heart it's love and and you know my relationship with dean potter i think kind of showed that dean um was a very intense person to work with and he would try to intimidate you. And he would use intimidation in a lot of different ways to get what he wanted from you, but also to make you aware of the dangers you might have had in the moment around you and him especially. You know, you're working with soloists, you don't project your energy toward them. You have to stay really neutral, almost hidden. You can't, you can't draw their energy toward you. They can't worry about you. You can't worry about them. You need to make this photo. They maybe just want to hear the sound of your shutter. That's the only thing they need in, in, in these moments. So keeping your energy close, right? And knowing when to let your energy out. I remember one night, um, it was right before I published the Stone Master book. I had no money. I had been running off of a small inheritance. My, from my father had died a couple of years previous. Uh, I took all that money and, and uh, well, the whole book itself, I mean, let me get back to the way that book started, actually, which is kind of fascinating. So I had always wanted to make a book. And uh, when I started the Stone News Project in 1999, I, I figured that would be the book and I would publish it in, in 2009 after 10 years. But the project actually went 20 years, but I did publish after 10. But the first book ended up being the Stone Master book. So I had this idea for years about making this book, the Stone Master book. And I... Uh, called up John Long and he's like, well, no, I don't, I, he was into making films at that point and he was making money. He was working. He didn't really have the time to do the stone master book. No one was going to pay him to do it in the moment. So he kept dodging my calls. Eventually the calls would just go straight up to, to voicemail. And I call him a few times a year for years for a decade or so. And then one night in 2007, I got this call in the middle of the night. And I, by this time I'd been back making climbing photographs and stone nudes and such for what, eight, nine years. Backer calls me, he goes, Bullwinkle, um, you got to make the book. 
I had made a, I had made a bunch of calendars and uh, been in a bunch of magazines, my work. And so, but anyway, I had made a book and, uh, I go, well, what book? He goes, you know, the book, the Stone Master book. And I'm like, well, it takes more than me to make that book. It would take you. It would take John Long because he's a writer. I need a writer. I can't write. And uh, this is really about 2007 when this all happened. And so I called up Long. I told Backer I'll get back to him. I got to talk to Long. Called up Long, got his voicemail. He knew I was calling him. Left a message. I heard nothing back. Called Backer up and I said, hey, Backer, man, um, I talked to Long, and I mean, I didn't talk to Long. I left a message, and I don't think that book's going to happen. He goes, what book? And he had actually been drunk. It was a drunk phone call. He forgot all about it. But anyway, right before he died, he knew that I'd taken care of him. Like, he was like, where's the book? I go, it's at the printer's, man. It's going to come out. You know, I go, I, did, you know, I took care of you, bro. I took care of you. know, you're the you're man. You're the man. And he died a couple months later. But anyway, uh... So Long is basically dodging me. So anyway, in 2007, I get this call from Long. He goes, remember that Stone Master book idea you had? And I go, yeah, f yeah. And he goes, I got a publisher that's interested in doing it. And I go, I'll get back to you. And then I called him back and I said, hey, you know, I, I want to make this book. And then I thought in my head, but you've been dodging me for a decade. And then I said, but I would prefer if we self-published. And then I said in my head, that way I can control as much as I can possibly control and get this thing really beautiful. Because I knew it had a possibility, you know. And he agreed, and he agreed to do the writing. And we, we had like a two-year period of gathering. And it was really kind of beautiful. I would, I would, whatever car or van I had, I would drive down to his place in Venice. He had this little shack in the back of this house. And I would camp in the garden in my tent or sleep in my van at the end of this cul-de-sac in Venice. And we would laugh and send each other articles to read on the interwebs and trade photos. And he would read his stuff, you know, when an author is reading what, he's, what, what they're working on, he or she, when the author reads to you something that's in progress, it's a really beautiful thing. And you understand the intonation and what, what's there, if they're good, and he's really good. Um, we had this like, kind of a pink cloud, you know, I was getting high all the time. He wasn't getting high. That was the only kind of a bummer, but he allowed me to get high near him, even in his house. So I love the smell as so I'm smoking 50 fifties. And, and, uh, then, um, it got to a point where, uh, I needed a designer. You know, I had never made a book, right? Mm. So I needed a designer. And I ended up um, wanting to use this designer that Patagonia used who'd made Glenn Denny's book because Glenn Denny was really one of my mentors. And he talked to me a lot when I asked him questions about making my own book after he made Yosemite in the 60s, which is an inspiring book. And so I got this introduction to this guy, Tom Adler, who lives in Santa Barbara. And at this point, I had very little money left. I had like $350 left at the inheritance. I'd spent everything. He says, yeah, um, he goes, gosh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fucking busy. And he goes, all right. He goes, you want me to make a book? You want me to design your book? I go, yeah. He goes, what size is your book? I go, 10 by 12. How many pages is your book? Uh, a little bit over 200. And he goes, huh, a little bit over 200. How many photos? No, wait. How many pages of text? How many words is your book? I go, I think it's about 52,000. He's like, how many photos? 110. You hear him thinking, he goes... All right, I'll see you. Bring me your text and bring me your photographs. I'm not promising you anything. He goes, who's going to publish it? I go, self-publish. He goes, Shit. this guy's saying Shit. he's real successful. He does all these surfing books. They're gorgeous, you know, coffee table books. So anyway, so I'm like, uh, probably at Long's, I go, I got to see this designer. You want to come with me? He goes, hell no. Um, and, and, and also the last thing that Tom Eller said, yeah, I'll see you then. Bring some money. I go, Long, you got any money? Long is notorious. He's not going to give me a dime. Um, it's like, so I, I'm driving up there. It's like uh, kind of like it's uh, like 11, 1030 in the morning when I'm supposed to meet him. So Ventura, which is right before Santa Barbara, where he lives, or he lives just south of Santa Barbara. But anyway, uh, I pull over. There's his Vons. I used to live in Ventura on a sailboat years before that, working for Gamichi Products. But anyway, different story, different decade. Uh 
I walk into the Vons and they have the sushi there and I buy some sushi rolls because I'm kind of like a little shaky. I haven't, it's cheap and it's good, right? And I go back to my car in the parking lot and I drive it underneath this little overpass on the way to the on-ramp for the 101 North. There's like a little car park place, park and ride, but people park there and run on the bike path. So I pulled in between a Mercedes and a, uh, a, a newer Ford and I had a beat up red uh, Nissan with a ratty camper shell that I used, you know, I used to sleep in the back of the thing. I'm all over the place. Yosemite, I'm sleeping down by the river in the million dollar sandbar, right? Anyway, um, now I'm eating. And I look in my mirrors, something was freaking me out. I look in my mirrors on both sides. There's Ventura sheriffs with their hands on their holster walking up on me. And I put my hands on the wheel because I knew the drill. And I said, can I help you? And they go, they looked in, saw my hands on the wheel and they go, uh, well, you can't eat here. And I looked to my left and the guy on the Ford late model was chewing on a bagel and drinking coffee. And the, the person in the Mercedes on the right was eating something and drinking coffee. And I'm like, well, don't you think you should arrest those people too, officer? And they go, well, when I arrest you, you know, what are you doing here? Do you live in your vehicle? You know, and I was feeling so good, right? Because I hardly had enough money, but I knew that if I can get this guy to accept this, this book was going to happen, that no one thought was going to happen. And it was going to be really beautiful. So all of a sudden, you know, you, you have to defend yourself for being homeless, which wasn't the case. Um, I had a tent in the woods down by the river. Uh, but anyway, so, you know, I kind of like, you know, they're like, well, there's been car burglaries here. And I'm like, dude, you know, what are you, they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm, I'm going to see my designer. You know, I'm almost crying. And I'm like, it doesn't really fucking matter, does it? They just sort of let it go. And then I finished my food and I went up there and I got up there and Tom looks at everything and he's got these you're looking through the disc of the photos and he's looking at some of the writing and he's looking, looking at me, he's looking, he goes, uh, tell you what, he goes, you got, how much, you got a couple hundred bucks, 250, he goes, you know, here's the thing is I don't really, he goes, I don't do the production. I have a guy who does production. He goes, I like what I see. I would like to do a, like a rough draft. Take me about a week. I'll, I'll be calling you in the next few days. You know, I need to pay this guy to get him going. So I gave him like 250. So now I've got like 75 bucks back. You know, I got to get back to the valley. I had enough for gas and get up there, right? So um, I get up to the valley and I'm sitting there just twiddling the lungs like, well, what's going on, you know? And I'm like, I don't know. And like a week later, the first draft comes and man, floored me. It was gorgeous. And he, he was calling me all the time. He goes, what is this photo work that? He goes, the way you organize this stuff is amazing, dude amazing i go i just organized it in like a really linear way that my mind was working he goes it's perfect and he goes how about this and that and i had given him folders with other photos in there to cover any eventuality so i had it all covered and and i saw that first draft and it just floored me and he goes so he goes you don't have a publisher let's talk about a publisher or what it would take and he ended up setting up a deal before the book was even done in design with patagonia books so they ended up buying like a thousand or two thousand at you know above wholesale because they had their imprint in it and, he, and then i got mike ram for kermichi products to put up the rest of the money but it was like a really kind of a financial success from the beginning uh and we haven't gone into a second printing because there was basically three partners in it me long and graham and apparently none of us can agree on anything except for the making the book so that's why it hasn't come out again but uh it was a really beautiful thing the whole experience even to the point where the cops were hassling me for being a homeless hippie climber, whatever the hell you want to call me, artist I do. Um, it validated me. I remember when I was collecting photographs from Bridwell, I had to pay them and stuff and with weed and some money. And it was funny because I've known him forever and I loved him dearly. I was there when he took his last breath in the hospital. I was one of the people with the family, beautiful man. Um, he goes, I'm collecting these photos. Boy, go, what the hell? He goes, what, what do you have to give to climbing? And I was like, oh, come on, Jim. I got nothing, really. I'm just collecting these photos, bro. Can you help me out, you know? 
I mean, I had known this guy for 30 years by that point. It must have had some value, I thought. Uh, but when the book came out, he looked at it, he goes, Bridget, he goes, Poinkle, you've done good. You've done good. Mm -hmm. And I, and even Backer at some point had said to me, you know, how old are you and you don't have anything? And you're trying to do this thing and you're getting photos from me. And and before he died, he said, you know, remember that time I said all that about you not being able to take care of yourself because you can live in your van down by the river. He goes, I, I, I was wrong. Mm. Thank you for what you've done, you know. Backer said that? Yeah. Must felt good. Uh, I would feel better if he was still alive. Yeah. Because he could say better things. But no, um, yeah, those are the moments. Those aren't the moments you live for. You live for the moments that based your friendship with those people. Mm. But when they really, I have a longtime friend, Mike Leklinski, he lives in Josh Tree. And when he introduced me to people, he goes, Dean is an artist. And he goes, like, what I mean is his stuff is on walls and stuff in museums. Like, he's an artist. So it's like this way of introducing me with, like, this respect, right? Sure. Which is really all you want to do because that's all you kind of try to give is respect. Sometimes you fail in that. But uh, so, like I say, it, it, within living your life, however that life ends up being, you have the power to manifest that life by by only by acknowledging exactly what it is in your life now that would not allow for that life to happen. Because once you open yourself up to it, small opportunities will present themselves that will eventually go into larger opportunities if you seize those moments in, in your life. Um, right. And if you're doing it for yourself, for your life, for your education, for your, you know, uh, for your passion, like if you find a passion stay with it mm. and, and sometimes it doesn't bring you to exactly the point that you thought you would end up but it brings you right to where you need to be life's a series of choices there's that there's nothing good or bad about the choices or wrong or right they're simply choices some Leads of them work out path. better <laughs> we're, we're sitting here doing a podcast right now mm -hmm. a month ago you didn't know we'd be doing a podcast not at all now. you and know this it's is wonderful it's just a series of choices and, and you know, there, your life can head in a direction based off of those choices. And then as it goes in a direction, you can make choices to alter that path further. It's going in a direction that you don't like it. And mm -hmm. You have to make changes based off of the decisions you made before. Exactly. You can't go backwards. You have to make decisions based off of where you are now. Mm -hmm. You can fix yourself in time and place you're still going to undergo change, mm. you know, forever. Right. And you can, like I, when I went back to you, somebody kind of, you know, you can go back again, but nothing's the same. It's not, the possibility is not there. Things change. Yes. And to hold on to the way things were before doesn't allow you to evolve into the person that you're becoming. If you hold on to something from before. Yeah. That's why people become as they age, it seems like a lot of people become closed mind, mm. closed minded, I should say, um, or they complain about what is. And I love to complain about what is because I'm ranting and I know I am. And so it's done with really dark, sarcastic humor, I would hope. But if you're not open to everything that's going on around you and if you, you're viewing everything through the lens of hypocrisy or commerciality or bitterness from love's lost you'll just continue with that outlook mm. it's self-propagating you've stacked your emotions and your life in a way that's just going to give you emotional psychic pain until you close everything off right or medicate the hell out of it or what have you that's the point where you're really static and you need to be honest with yourself and all you need to start making is micro adjustments at first to steady your course. Mm. Once you actually can see a course, right? Rather than throwing it all away. Yeah. There's no need for that, right? And, and I understand that work is difficult and it breaks your body. And I know I get all that. I've done a lot of that. And, and that's why I do a lot of this. 
in a way of, of a non-structured schedule that kind of bases around creativity and, and making things and, and what have you. It's not gonna, it's very satisfying. You're living your life in a way that makes you feel good. It I try. You too. Yeah, it challenges me. Yeah, but but once again, yeah, I do. I do go out of my way to live my life as simply as possible in a lot of ways. And art is a way. Art's a medium in which you can live your life in a meaningful way. Yeah, what? because you're you're drawing all your art from your life. Yeah, you're not getting an assignment. It's still, it's your life because you're on this assignment, but right. you're giving yourself your own assignments within your your uh, within your artistic capabilities, and including the people that are in your life mm. as part of that. Simply because, otherwise, you wouldn't be able to create. Like you know, let's say you want to make photographs of Chris Sharma. Well, it's going to be difficult for you to go up and asking them. You know, can I travel with you? Right. Mm -hmm. But we were friends enough that I did travel with him, right? And so if I want to continue doing that, I can continue in those veins, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. It was like, then there was a relationship and I just chose to work within this relationship, you know, uh, a partnership or what have you that brought me to another place. And I, I don't regret it. Uh, I could have stayed, let's say with Chris or, you know, with, uh, big up productions or any of those guys because they were my friends at the very beginning. And the thing is I contributed my part and then I did my thing and they actually, uh, Josh Lowell from big up productions, he actually published the first stone nudes calendar. Mm. And, you know, Chris is, was in the men's and he's always been a huge fan of mine and we've worked together. We hopefully we'll work together again soon, maybe this spring. And so, yeah, I just look at it. Oh yeah. A little bit of this, a little that. And then, you know, 20 years, 30 years, it, it seems to still be going and yeah. I'm, I'm okay with that. You know, there's no retirement plan because if I was retired, I'd probably want to do the same thing, right? Exactly. In a way. And so you, if you understand yourself and your motivations enough by being honest enough with yourself, but not like getting too down on yourself. Because it doesn't allow you to do anything productive if you're just criticizing yourself all the uh, time. Yeah. The first time we spoke, we, we spoke about love and art in the same vein that do what fulfills you mm -hmm. and someone's going to appreciate your photographs or someone's going to come along and want to spend time with you in a romantic sense but mm -hmm. there's no use in pretending to be something that you're not no at all it's a waste of time it's a waste of time it's a waste of energy it's a waste of really your life it, it, it can be that yeah I, I agree with you it's like you know, be the best you you can possibly be, whatever that means. And, and, and But it doesn't give you license to be an asshole. But it, <laughs> when you're young, you don't see it as much. But really, honestly, there's a structure to everything moving forward. Sure. And your life will be structured stronger than you can ever imagine at some point. And like I say, if you allow yourself to be closed off because you've hung on to certain precepts that are no longer valid, mm. uh, you'll suffer. Yeah. And even if you try to keep open and you're attracting people into your life, you're still going to suffer to a certain extent with love because you are such an individual that it's inevitable that you, you know, someone's going to leave you or you're going to leave someone because that's how your life is. And that's what you want. You feel like if you got into a 20 year endless marriage with kids and the family, that that wasn't going to work for you. You were, you know, I was suffocating if I tried that. Mm. Every time I did kind of look in that direction, my body broke. The same as it does with the relationships, you know. It, it, I physically manifested things that, yeah. that told me, you know, I'm getting headaches on my back, whatever, that I shouldn't be where I am. Your uh, idea of perfection has to almost align with someone else's idea of perfection, or at least... Mm move in a similar direction and if it's a totally un incompatible so okay. people are in your life for a reason when those reasons change the people change mm. we all don't walk the same path from beginning to end sometimes we're lucky if we have a partner that does and i think society tells us that that's what we need or or is an ideal within it and and i don't fault that but for myself it's not true and for many of the people that i've engage in relationships and friendships with it hasn't been true 
Life doesn't move in. The, life does move in a linear path because there's a certain amount of numbers and seconds that you'll get, but it doesn't move as linearly as you want it to, and you believe that it will. And if you don't fulfill yourself, it will come back on you. It just takes more time. You can become the the alcoholic that doesn't go out anymore. You can become all kinds of stuff, buried in unfulfilled desires have a secret life people do all these things they still want all this stuff and you can kind of have everything if you really want nothing right so like if you want some things that you don't have the money to get you didn't want it hard enough because you had to have the life that allowed you to have the money the thing you wanted to get so your wants were way outside your needs because all you really needed was you know a place down by the river to sleep you understand what, what it is you need and what you want might be out of whack. Should you chase your wants? Sure. Go right ahead. You might end up in a bad place. You might end up in a good place. I, it's just life. It's choices. It's the choices once again. I've created videos for a lot of clients and people because I thought that I was creating. Well, you know, was, there's times when you need to, that I thought I need to create for you need to because you need to live. Yes. You need to eat. It's not totally what you're passionate about, but it's the best time when you have that complete choice to create what you want to create. And I think that it's something to really be said about the same reason why you were creating with, with the stone masters is because their art and your art aligned. Yes. It's the same reason why you told me, I like what you do. Let's do this podcast. Right. If you didn't align with it, you'd say no. And exactly. And you do your life. Yeah. And you're not mean about it. It's just, you want to fulfill yourself like, and and what really completes you and your journey. You know, I want to produce so much. I know I'm only going to produce so little because that's been my history. And so, but I wanted to say what I, I feel is needed for me to, to express, right? Sure. Uh, I'm not leaving my my community of climbing by any means, but I'm also looking at some other facets of my life that I haven't been able to experience because of my life in climbing mm. or because of this focus that I've had on uh, climbing is my canvas and the people are the paint. I understood that. I've done other paintings, other kinds of stuff, but this is the stuff I'm known for. Mm. And I know my audience. These are the people that come into my life and go through it. And so they're artists, athletes. And I kind of consider myself that in a way. Um, And I've been around so many. So I'm lucky, extremely lucky, right? much easier in a sense for me to, to achieve a lot of the stuff, mostly because I've hung in there than others, but it's all what Stiegler said, it's all in your backyard, it's all in your house, it's all there. You, you don't have to look very far. You just need to look within, find the balance, and then let it flow. I love that. <laughs> Thank you. That was uh, one, uh, one I wrote about the photograph that happened. You know, I wrote that immediately after I, the breakup started to happen took me over seven days to write it and I edited it. I had never really done that much editing to my work, but I edited it down and I actually showed it to someone else who uh, suggested some other edits and, and wording. And I actually took that down from my Instagram. I actually took down all the photographs that were related to that, that, that uh, um, relationship. I had only maybe put up a five photos. You know, I knew the idea and the context was for them to be in that book. But when I published the last one, I, I felt embarrassed for a moment. And so I took down all of them because I felt like they were just a little bit too close to who I was and, who, and what I wanted to show people. I, it, it, you know, I'm like, am I whining? And I'm not, you know, but at the same point, I'm like, oh, God, yeah, this, her name, this photograph, this story is really beautiful and i do want to share it i want to share it in a book and i don't know if i want to share it out there because it's like people it it attracted more interest in me romantically than i didn't intend that Mm. you know what i mean yeah i I didn't intend that people take it in that context it was actually from me to her uh so it wasn't the right medium to share yeah 
I should have just sent it in a text and I might have, but she might not have gotten it or what have you. So I ended up putting it up there. Uh, and only it, 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 it did embarrass me. I go, this is a little, you know, I, I don't mind showing that to people, but it's like, you're really, you're really just talking to one person. Mm. And, uh, that in and of itself is manipulative given the situation to put it in the public view, just like I'm manipulating her. I mm. don't want that to be part of that whole thing. Like, yeah, she eventually did see it and she may have read it online there and she was fine with it, but I wasn't because hmm. I wasn't fine with anything in that moment. Right. That's self-aware. Yeah. And so I did that and the thing, it's not lost forever. It'll be in my book. You know, that those four or five photographs will be in the book that we make with each other. And then my other book that I'm making now. Yeah. I want to ask you about that. Like in today's age, when so many people are you know, getting canceled and things, did you mm -hmm. ever worry about, you know, creating art that some people could be, could see it as, you know, exploitive or, you know, it's not mainstream. Did you ever mm -hmm. worry about thinking, is this worth it? Or did you know that you were doing it in a way that people were going to be fine with it? Yeah. I, and, and that's the main thing is, is once again, it all got back to the idea that I'm clear operating with you know, the people that matter are the people that are in the photographs. And I've, and I've never had any real neg at all negative feedback from any of the people that participated in actually making a photograph with me. In fact, they've all said, and there were, a lot of them have said, oh, you know, I've never felt so comfortable being in front of someone I wasn't intimate with being naked. Because mm. you're not judging with that. It goes back to that whole thing about pre-impressing something, especially with a photograph when you let that person know. And they've already seen the work. At Can you explain that to people? Pre-impressing, sure. we were talking about that yeah, last night, yeah. and I'd never Love heard it. that before. From marketing. Marketing, yes. Uh, and and it, it starts with the precept of impression, making an impression on someone. In this case, making the impression on the consumer. Um, but you can use it in your life, and, and, and artists probably use it a lot more than they actually think. And I use it quite a bit, especially when you're making nudes of someone that's never posed for a nude before maybe has only been you know nude around an intimate lover and then you're actually asking them to climb something where there's a possibility of injury if they fall uh and where they're very exposed so you, there's a lot of trust that has to happen and, and a lot of these people i have never met before it's a collaboration we're working on something to make things look beautiful. And so I know the fact that when you find the body that's in balance, whether there's clothes or not or on them, they're going to look beautiful when the balance point is achieved. And I know on any climbing, no matter how steep, there's balance, balance and power, balance and technique. And when you make those photographs with the environment, the boulder, the sun, everything, the light, all achieving the same balance, you have a timeless photograph. So if you're listening out there and you wanted to make a nude, I just pre-impressed you. Like, I'll put you in that photograph. You will be a part of that photograph. That photograph will only happen because of the balance you're able to achieve when you climb. And you know what that balance is because you feel it. That's the good feeling when you're climbing well. That's when I'm going to make that photograph of you. When you're achieving perfection. And so that's what pre-impression is. Before... You make an impression. When you walk in to see an employer, you sit down and you wait for them to talk. Why didn't you ask them why, out of all the applicants, they decided to give you a sit-down interview? What qualities in it, in you and your resume, do they have that impresses them? And they'll tell you everything about yourself and what they like about you. Do you think they will? That's like They wild, might or right? they might not. They might hate that. They might hate it. Society. But, yeah. But you've taken the initiative, and... but they might hate that because <laughs> now they have to give up control in a way. But like, you can try that as you go through life, as you want to make these impressions, you let people know what they can expect. So much of the world, though, has gone on and, and has become like patterns and the way things mm. people do things. And, you know, you you have to go to work because you have to make money because you have to pay rent and you have to pay taxes mm. and things just go on as a pattern. Yes. And it has to be like a collective change in order to become accepted, like a, a certain amount of uh, people yeah. or so for me to walk into a job interview and go, so why do you like me? 
if I'm just that one guy doing it, right. it's very out of place. Yeah, there, and there's that. So you have to moderate what you've got going on t to the situation. Yeah. But also always trying to be out in front of what's going on mm. is a really good practice. You have to be out in front of this stuff. You have to think about all these situations days or months before you actually have to do this. Otherwise, you're going to freeze up. You always have to take action in the face of risk. Otherwise, you're just giving into the risk. Um, and it's the same thing with your life. So in, in, in the end, there's plenty of, I mean, obviously right now, with 10 million job openings and 9 million people un unemployed or more, you know, official statistics, right? People are taking action in their lives because mm. they were shut down for a year. Everybody was in their own personal prison in a sense for a year and not even what prison is about but in a sense somebody told you what to do and continue to do so and and then they saw that same thing in their jobs and they thought maybe they could go a different direction and and you know i kind of applaud that in a big way and now the labor market is kind of changing because of that you know first it was unions in the 30s that had some power behind the actual worker and now it's the workers themselves changing the philosophy of what you know, what is I want to do and how much do I really need to do that and what's the minimum amount I can farm myself out for and so I can actually live this quality of life. Like I said, it has to be a collective change in order to have a shift. Yeah, and I kind of feel you know, that whole critical mass. Mm. In some things, critical mass, hopefully, well, I don't think it's still been reached as far as racial equality. I think it's still, there's a long way to go with that. And all across the board with racial, gender, you know, whatever it is, there's some things that I find um, not necessarily in a logical progression. Other things I find that, yeah, very much so. I have to watch myself because I span these generations. And, and a lot of the ideas that I've picked up from previous history and experience aren't valid now. Honnold just shared a an article about climate change. And it was talking about collective versus individual change when it comes to climate. But in mm. terms of anything, I think it is about having that perception of I can make a difference and doing that, mm -hmm. assuming that people around you are going to do that as well. Yeah, and, and a lot of times that's what motivates people to do things is what they can see around them and the people they wanna be a part of that group. Yeah, of people are part of that movement, whether it's van life or climbing life or the mix of the two. And there's a lot of pe more people in van life that they don't climb, you know, mm. but they're they're doing their own adventure. Uh, and, and that's fine. There's a number, you know, and, and they're part of a bigger thing. Mm. And they, they have the possibility to become a collective consciousness. People's minds are still kind of closed on accepting things. Right. Mm. It, it's it takes generations to actually change, I think, in a way, when you find other people following this path, uh, almost independently of where things started, but they, they get an idea that it does exist. Uh, so I see that uh, more in America, I can see more migrations happening of people mm. from one side to the other side, you know, for a lot of different reasons. You know, politically, the United States just, you know, it's it's messed up. It goes one way, then it goes really strongly the other way. And it doesn't seem like there's a lot of moderation in between. And, you know, I see that even though my life is, you know, kind of not moderate. And, and it's, it's a construct. So, but I do see things like, and I see new normals happening. Especially with the pandemic. Yes. It's not that Change people in different. California are affected. Right. It's, the whole world is affected. Yes, so it's, exactly. go it's going to be some change. It's going to be a collective change due to the fact that yeah. it's not just a small group mm -hmm. that's dealing with coronavirus. Mm -mm. It's everybody. Yeah, but even though we want to believe, you know, that it's not us or it's not going to affect us until it actually does mm -hmm. or what have you. Yeah, it, it's affecting world travel. I want to go down to Patagonia this, this uh, December or January. It's probably not going to happen because they're probably not going to be open. Mm. Or it's going to be really difficult to, to do all that with COVID, and which is fine. It just is what it is. You know, um, I went to see a friend out in Bo Bozeman um, over the Labor Day weekend, and uh, I hadn't flown in a long time. You know, and I really don't like flying. It's not that I feel 
I, I feel claustrophobic a bit. That's the only reason why I don't like it. And I feel like, you know, I'm an animal pushed into the seat, you know. But it was okay once I moderated my attitude and, and didn't feel like that animal pushed in the seat and like, you know, felt a little bit more, got pushed myself out of myself a little bit more in order to, to vibe with the group and just enjoy the flight, you know. There was a couple, two 40, one, one hour, 40 minute flights. I'm like, come on, man, you can deal with this. It's an attitude shift. Like, of course, it's not like your ideal. It's not your paradise. No, well, you, you can <laughs> suffer and hate it or you can make the best of it. <laughs> you should see me with lines. Like I'll walk into a supermarket, look at the line, turn around and walk oh, out. I'm the same way. <laughs> it bugs the hell out of something. Like, what are you doing? I'm like, you know what I'm doing. And I hate lines. I go, oh, come or when you hungry. <laughs> when you're going through the grocery store and you you got your cart full of whatever and then you see the line. Yeah, exactly. Like, well, oh, I'm in it now. Man. <laughs> are, are you in, yeah. Uh, it's back there. Jesus. So, yeah, so I don't like any of that. So I'm like uh, I always try to have whatever it is I think I'm going to need prepared yeah. and ready to go or whatever. I never do and I always go without and I get grouchy and need to go in there and get my food. So it, it always comes back to bite me and I'm like, oh, you just don't have any patience. And after, you know, at your age, you should realize you should have decades of patience. <laughs> or you're out of it. <laughs> or none at all. Or you're just out of it and that's all you're living in is patience ready, you know, the patience it takes to d get ready to die, I suppose. Wait until you die. Dean, uh, Dean told me, he goes, Winky, whatever happens, you know, because I used to do a lot of ground crew for him and I used to help him rig. Yeah, his assistant rigging and made a lot of photos and so on. So rigging, just so people know, like rigging. Rigging like his that. high lines yeah. or, you know, whatever he needed. He said, uh, Winky, you know, if I die doing this today or whatever, uh, you'll know I died doing something I love. And no, I think that his last words were, mother or is he fucking crashed head first into the damn rock and bounced up the slope and came to a rest right on the edge of salvation. I don't think he was loving it in that moment. I think he knew exactly what was happening here and he was just going to stick it or it wasn't going to stick it. And he didn't. And so like, yeah, I want to die doing what I love. Ooh, I want to die loving life. I want to be alive until I die. And for me, being alive is a lot more than um, just biding time. As long as I'm breathing, I want to kind of enjoy what I'm doing. And I want to continue producing work. And I want to, you know, it's just, I, all these wants. None of them are really needs per se. There's a lot of things I still want to do and I probably will and a lot of things I probably won't do. But I'm, as long as the opportunities continue to happen, I'm going to take those. No matter what they happen to be in. How much of, you know, events like, you know, Dean's death and, and other people that, have you, that you've seen pass away, how much of that changes the way that you live your life? Because, you know, I, I remember when my dad came into the living room and told me, oh, this guy named Dean passed away base jumping, and I knew immediately who it was. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I didn't know him. But having been aware of the culture of what you guys were doing, I knew that was just an immensely painful thing to those who were, were close to him and yeah. people who didn't know him. So how much of dealing with the death of those who you're so close with and, and having to mourn affects the way you live your life? Um, yeah, I took uh, four or five years to get over Dean. I'm still not over him. I remember him. I, I wish he was around. You know, but even Sean Leary, right before that, the year before that, and, and um, you know, it, it, it completely affects you. Yeah, you because know, you, you know someone over such a long time, decades, you have that time together. And, and you've been around when they've done things that, you know, have taken huge risks. And then they're gone. You, you develop so much trust and maybe even broken trust that was then repaired. All kinds of things have gone through these friendships if you're actually friends with someone for decades. 
or even a nickel five years or a few years, you know, it, it, you see their lives. And I was older than most of these guys, right? And I saw their lives in a very different way in comparison to me at the same time. And I knew what they were feeling and I knew a lot of what their, their dreams were because they told me. And sometimes I helped them achieve some of those and, and recorded some of those, um, expressed them. You know, with Dean, man, like I, I, I want to say it, but you know, I, I made my first ten thousand dollar photo. They, you know, Patagonia bought the rights to him uh, slacklining or soloing a high line with El Cap in the background. And you know, I remember all I remember was the days that we, you know, we walk up there all the way up to the base of the lower spire because it was rigged to the lower to the higher spire kind of thing, or whatever it was, and and we we do this forty five minute hike up from the forest into the boulder field and we'd go get to the base and he had these this mini traction line set up on this five six thing that went up a few hundred feet to this ledge that the slack line went off of and he let me mini track that so i just put in this device on the line and i'd be able to climb if i were to fall i'd go onto the device so it was easy it wasn't going to and he would be climbing right next to me he'd be soloing right because it's easy ground right and he just put that in there because i got my camera he might even take the pack so i had nothing and, he was, he'd be laughing, you're, you're over gripping or whatever. And we'd get to the, to the ledge and then we'd have some food and smoke some weed. And then it took a couple of days to, to get the line across and pull it. And then we did this photograph where I, he, he put the leash on. So he was tethered to the line. So if he fell, he wouldn't die. Went across it a couple of times. And then I put a roll of film in my camera and he said, are you ready? And I said, yeah. And then I started making these photos and as he got like within three feet of the end, I suddenly realized that he was no longer tethered because it took me a few minutes to realize he was a bit shaky on the couple, first couple steps. And then we got into rhythm with the photos and I made my photograph and then he jumps for the end and, you know, he stuck it. It was no big deal. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that, you know, oh, wow. You know, and so I made these photographs they're beautiful photographs and, and my energy was close, you know. I was doing my job. And then that night, uh, we went down. It got late because he was done. He was kind of psyched, you know, and we, we smoked some dope and ate some more food and it got dark. And we're, it was almost dark when we were repelled to the ground. And then we walked past the boulder field and went in, in the twilight. So there was enough to see. And then in front of us was sort of this gloomy forest. And then the car, you know, 20 minutes away. And uh, as we started to go into the forest, Dean, who was walking barefoot, stopped and reached into his pack and he pulled out two headlights because headlamps because Dean was always prepared because he his partners were always not prepared. And he handed me the headlamp. I, I, I said, no, I handed it back to him. And he goes, why? I go, because what about the time that we don't have the headlamps? Sometimes you're going to need to find your, your way home in the dark. And he kind of looked at me. Oh, I go, you're a wise man. And I go, wise ass. Let's go. And we walked into the dark forest and made our way home. But you know, like, like I was savoring the moment. Mm. I, I, I've written about the photograph. But the whole day, the whole week, was really beautiful. And then the photograph, the Patagonia wanted lifetime rights or something like that, and they bought it. And then they, he got kicked off the company and they, they can't use it. But yeah, you know, there was money on the end of it. I, I knew he had sponsors, but I was just there to hang out and make that photograph. And it was just as exciting for me to mini track up those lines while he was soloing next to me laughing, you know? Yeah. As to going into the forest with the light out and stumbling a bit now and then as to the whatever money came out of it right uh i just enjoyed the hell out of being around him you know and so many other times one time sean leary is on top of half dome and he gives me this call he's uh, i'm gonna do some hiking today you want to come down and hang and i go hey where are you man he goes half dome i go yeah what time six six forty five all right and that meant I would get on my bicycle and I'd ride up the Half Dome. And on the way up, he'd be looking to make sure there's no rangers because he's going to be base jumping out there right around twilight. As soon as the light's off Half Dome, he's going to go. 
And this is after the love of his life, his soulmate, Roberta, had died in a car accident maybe five years previous. And he had moved on, but I don't know if he had stopped loving her. Um, anyway, so he's on top of Half Dome, and I look around. I give him a text. Things are good. He gives me a call. What's up? I'm like, yeah, it's all good now. He goes, all right, uh, why don't you uh, give me five minutes, and, and I'll give you a two-minute look around. All right. So, you know, five minutes goes by, and he Text me two minutes. I'm, I'm all good. He hucks. And I've gotten really good at picking him up as they leave the exit. Like, at first, you don't know about bass confidence. But I've done so many ground crew for so many bass jumpers all over the place, keep them safe away from the Rangers and stuff. So I saw him as he came off. And, and normally, these guys have wingsuits. They can start coming away from the base, tracking out. Well, Sean didn't have a wingsuit that day. He was slick, which means he no wings and he's just gonna track which is fine but on half dome the these slabs come way out so it's like vertical a couple thousand feet but below that it's a couple three thousand feet of slab you got to get past those slabs you can't land on them so what you needed to do in, in this case is maybe fall about halfway down the face of half dome or so roughly a certain amount of seconds or whatever while trying to track out from the rock without wings, so you're not going to get all that far. You'll get some distance. And then deploy, so you're high enough that now you can outfly these slabs and you're going to get down to where I am, which is way back there in Muir Lake in kind of a hidden meadow that you can see from above but not from around when you're on the ground. And so I pick him up and he's going. And he's falling. I go, he's slick, you know. He's falling and he's falling. He goes past that halfway kind of crescent in half dome. And he's still going. I expect him to pull. He's going. Now he's over the slabs. And he's fucking going, right? And I'm like, I get that feeling, you know. For me, it's like goes up from the stomach and gets stuck right there in your chest. And then you, you struggle a little bit for the air. And I'm like, oh, my God. Because he's not deploying. And the thing was, he was too close to the slabs. So if you actually reach in to deploy to grab your pilot... In the moment that you bring your arms, both arms in to be symmetrical, you probably dropped about 10 or 15 feet, which is going to bounce your ass right off those slabs. He's maybe 30 feet above it. It's going to take at least 100 feet of air to get that rig out. And I know it. And he knows it. And you can see his shadow, even though it's just twilight. And he's running on top of his shadow. And then he's clear. But as soon as you're f***ing clear, you've got 100, 150 feet below you and he just fucking went for it and I saw the chute come out and then I saw him just not even get onto the handles but he's pulling on something then I see him go right into this tree and my heart is pumping and I start to run across the river and up the slabs and I get this text I'm okay and I waited and he came down I said what the fuck Sean he goes oh man I'm slick you know I don't have anything to track and I got out over the slabs. I realized it was too close to the slabs. And as soon as I got clear, man, he goes, it was good. It was good. I go, no, dude, you were in the air for like three seconds when you got a rig. That's not enough, you know? He goes, oh, I got between the fucking, you know, tree and the wall there. And, and even my rig didn't even get stuck. You know, I go, what the f***, Sean, what happened? He goes, nothing happened. I go, what happened? He goes, I was thinking about Roberta. He goes, man, I was thinking about her really strong, you know? I was like, you can't. You can't do that, Sean, you know? And then, I don't know, two or three years later, he was thinking about somebody else when he jumped off at night in Zion and started flying into this V canyon, which eventually would open up into clear air where he could deploy. It was a full moon, and he texted a few people, and he jumped. And he had a wingsuit on, and he was flying it fairly well, and he was in the bright moonlight. And he knew the line went into the dark, so he crossed into the moon shadow. Maybe went a little bit too far, pushed it a little bit too hard, because at some point he kissed the wall. And he continued bouncing around until he died about 200 feet later on a ledge. And, you know, there's no more Sean. He 
year later, there's no more Dean. And before that, there was no more Jose, and there was no more this guy, and there was no more Richie Rich, and there was no more that guy. And I started making these history books. And maybe in the end, that's what started me writing, because I know that John was doing a lot of the writing, and some of the writing was done firsthand by the people in the books, and people started dying, and I realized that no one was going to tell these stories but me. I was there that day. I was a part of the equation, and I want to honor my friends and their memories, and I think telling some of these very personal stories because, you know, you might read about somebody dying or you might read about somebody living and doing something rad, like Dean doing some solo or Alex doing some solo, but you don't know the people. All you're looking at is a book cover and the chapter headings. Everybody who does something has people that help them along the way. They gave them the best of their, their life in a way. And they have a story they're, because they're such a part of that story. And so that's one of the things that motivates me. I'm like, who will tell his story? It, will it be just some writer who's maybe a good writer but really didn't know him in the way I knew him? You know, I, one time I remember I had to go to L.A. And like I said, I was 2009 and, and we had, I was sleeping up at Dean's place. And he, uh, I could hear him calling. He had a lower place. He goes, coffee. You know, it was like I told him I had to leave early in the morning because I had to get down to L.A. because uh, I was looking for this check because I had no money and I needed to get money to come back to Yosemite even, but I had to go down there for something publishing about the book. He knew I had to leave before dawn, so he was up before that. He called me down with coffee, and I remember we were drinking coffee and talking about because the fall was coming, so everything was a bit nippy in the morning. There was steam, and I had a 50-50 going, and he was smoking that. And he goes, uh, when are you coming back from L.A.? And I go, I don't know. You know, I'm kind of waiting on a check that's going to happen when I'm down there. And he had this, he always used to wear um, a tubular webbing belt that he would tie into a water knot. So if he was soloing someplace or whatever, he could just clip into that and it's full strength. That was his belt. And he wiggles the end, the burnt hand, he's wiggling on, when he finally cracks it. I can see he's wiggling something out from in there. He pulls out two $100 bills. And I knew what was going to happen next. He was going to give me this money, and I felt really kind of bad because I knew I, I, I was going to accept the money. And he goes, here. And I go, I'll pay you back. He goes, no. He goes, no. I need you here. And I was like, I'll, I'll come back. I'll come back next week, you know? And he goes, uh, good. And I said, hey, Dean. You tell me something, man. How come you got like $200 in your belt? And he goes, because you never know when they're going to be chasing you. Who? <laughs> exactly. It didn't matter whom. <laughs> Probably the Rangers for base jumping. For sure. But he wanted the money if he needed a ride. He was prepared. What a guy. For his life. Yeah. He, he chose a warrior's path. Man, just hearing clips of him talking about, I want to live my life yeah. the way I want to live my life. Mm -hmm. The dude was an outlaw. Yeah. He didn't live for anybody else. No, not in, in many ways. I mean, we, you know, like, I, man, we talk philosophy a lot. And like when the whole delicate arch thing went down, I was there with him when he was giving a lot of interviews. And, and, and I always told him to pick sort of a defiant tone. I was wrong as far as your career is you needed to pick it he needed to pick a different tone and a more conciliatory inclusive tone but i encouraged a more aggressive tone um it didn't help him but it was who he was we actually went to the park service gift shop and picked up edward abbey and made some quotes read some quotes for his interview and like but it was too you know it wasn't what the public wanted and so he bounced out of there and eventually ended up in prana eventually ended up over there at adidas but um, and he used to talk about his arts and I know that that was something I helped contribute because that's how I always talked and, and I told him why I talked like I talked and, and how I felt he was a performance artist and what I thought about his career arc and some of the things he was doing and he you know when you're that tight with someone yeah you know that's the friendships that's what friends do for each other or he asked me 
I let him know some of the advice was wrong because I'm not a very super successful person. Uh, I'm successful in other ways, I suppose. And I picked up a lot from him and he taught me how to walk high lines. He taught me a lot. He loved my work. He loved me. He always gave me that opportunity and, and until I, you know, would blow the opportunity or something like that. But he would always come back around again on me because we were family in the end. And he knew that no matter how much we argued and bickered, we would always make up because he goes, your family, it's just like we're siblings. I don't get it, but that's how it is. He goes, I didn't have a brother. I had two sisters. I go, I had a sister, you know? So like it was a 20 or so year difference, but it was like, we really understood each other well. And he was willing to suffer in many ways. And as I was willing to suffer and sacrifice in some ways, and you have so many of those friendships, so, mo so many moments of that. Being so, you know, entrenched in, in the world of climbing and, you know, having had these friends who have passed, did you always know that, you know, that was part of the, part of the game is these high risk activities? And how does, how do you mentally prepare for, you know, people doing, you know, soloing and going out and not knowing if you'll see them tomorrow? Yeah, you know, I think the first um, time that I remember was when I was a stone master and it must have been 74 or 75. We were in Yosemite, a friend of ours named Bill Antel, he he led up some 510 thing and there was some old slings and he actually put his rope through the slings and friction was being friction lowered and the slings burned through the old or the rope burned through the old slings and he ended up himself up he didn't die but he like he broke his back in a few places i believe he broke his foot pretty well and smacked his head and may have broken some other parts and i remember seeing him in bed talking to him maybe even bringing him some dope in the yosemite hospital that was one of the times i understood i started to figure out morality mortality but i've never had to deal with it even when other friends when friends have died because so early on when people died, like Tobin Sorensen, he died in 1980. He was one of my best friends. We used to go on all these trips together. And I was like, you know, young, like young. And I don't, I never related it to me. I knew I was going to die, but I never related that how, you know, how your death will feel to you. Like how conscious is of you, of it are you in your life? But when you're dealing with the death of someone you know versus your own death, it's mm -hmm. a different experience for sure. Um, definitely. Yeah. Completely different experience. And, you know, I, mean, I look for my phone. I can, their names are still there. You know, the numbers right. are still there. Um, and you, you go through all those stages of grieving with the denial and the bargaining and surrendering to it and, you know, letting go of it and whatever. You, you go through all this stuff at the same time. It, I detach from it. Right. That's what I've kind of always done, you know. And um, I, I think the, we used to have memorials for the, for our friends up there in, in the valley at the the pines, where they have an amphitheater outside. And I think that was one of the first times I started understanding that I could tell a story because I would go up there. People would say oh, I'm Miss Dean or whatever, and I just told a story about him. And it was funny and it was sad and it was, you know, everything. I remember, I remember feeling how people, it, that, that resonated because I just, you know, this is what I miss. Right. Kind of thing without saying that. And, um, and, and so I've done that since, right, in a real own personal way, just relating what happened between us in a moment. Could have just been a chapter heading if you didn't stop to read the words underneath it. So I'm trying to do that part. That's, that's kind of like kind of what I can do. Like, like I say, what I could do to communicate early on was simply make these photographs. Now what I can do to communicate is to talk about them. I think there's a certain moment in your life when you realize like death is a thing. Yeah. I think when you're younger, you take certain risks or you do certain things. But the real shift was for me, you know, I had, I had known people growing up who had passed away in car accidents, like up in the Santa Cruz mountains, those roads oh, are yeah, wild, yeah, yeah, yeah. winter's bad. But for me, it was the moment that I became aware, whether it was true risk or, you know, low risk was I was on a multi-pitch. I was on Royal Arches with mm. my girlfriend at the time. 
I was about four pitches up and I had a monumental freak out moment. Mm. And I don't know if I was in actual danger or if I, for some reason, felt that way, but I used to work on a ropes course in the Santa okay. Cruz Mountains. And when you're working with like elementary age kids, often on the low course, it's like 20 feet off the ground. Mm -hmm. And there's moments when kids have these moments when they're just screaming and they're terrified, terrified. And that's real to them. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely real. If they fell off, most likely they're not going to die unless they fell upside down or something. Right. But in that moment, I remember thinking, I know what those kids feel like. Yeah. But of course, it was a little bit of different stakes. You know, the ledge is below. It was like right. 40 feet and it doesn't look, you know, fun. Uh, but, you know, that was a moment for me when I was like, what am I what am I doing here? And, mm -hmm. but that's, you know, six, seven years ago. And I still look back at that thinking, was that, was I actually in danger? Was I not? I don't know. Right. But for me, it wasn't like fun. <laughs> um, no, it's not. No. So no. how do you reconcile that? Or, I mean, have you had moments like that where you go, what am I doing here? And then you go do it again. <laughs> um, I've had moments where I kind of introduce myself to myself. What do you mean? Well, it's, it's like, I mean, yeah, I've soloed the archers many times. Of course you have. Right. So, <laughs> but I've been on other climbs where I knew I could do the climb. I'm soloing the climb. I know I can do this thing. You have the opportunity here right now to finish this in a good way. Probably not a very good way. You have to introduce yourself to yourself. Your, your, your fear is going to get you to fall off this thing. Yeah. You have two choices. Either keep going or... Well, you have to face the fear yeah. right now and yeah. get get through this section because there's no rope. Get through it. Don't start freaking out. Don't start stabbing for holds. Don't start shaking. Don't start going on a sequence because you're trying to power it. Mm -hmm. It's going to take everything you've got right now, yeah. here and now, to be present, to get through this. So it's a matter of, like, be present, get through it. Uh, put a rubber band around your wrist and snap it. That'll bring you right back into the present because there's real pain. Yeah. So sometimes things get away from you and you're, yeah, oh, my God, I'm run out and there's this and that. But then at the same time, you know that you can't possibly fall here. Mm -hmm. A, because the climbing is easier than than your, your hardest stuff. And B, because falling there is going to be a bad consequence. Right. So you're either going to put a gear, a piece of gear on it, or you're going to understand that what you're doing is not that hard and you're making it hard. And so you just need to breathe a little bit and you just need to introduce yourself to yourself. And I need you right now to take care of this shit, right? We got to take care of business. So you have to make a decision for sure. There's this point, uh, there's this a couple of effects, but one is um, where they're talking about um, subconscious and how everybody has defense mechanisms, right? And they, they come up and how they're actually separate from your, your conscious, very separate. And you can actually talk to them you can give them names. You can say, hey, you know, anger, whatever you want to call him or her. Uh, you've been f***ing up my relationships for a long time. And uh, how old am I? How old are you? And you'll find they're very young and they don't even know how old you are. And they're the same part as you, you understand? So it's like mm -hmm. your defenses have been working for you all your life. And what the defenses means it, it it's how they stack the emotions how you stack them and you if you have these issues in life you you might look at what your defenses are putting in front of you causing you to be successful or unsuccessful what your defenses are doing to you in a relationship and then you you have to bargain with the defenses to let the adult you or whatever do this because you can do a better job of it and so you know, generally they, you try to figure out where they are. And for me, they probably be up in my chest. Other people, they might be in their stomach. Other people might get headache. You know, it's, there's a part of you that doesn't work for you a lot. It works against you and you've allowed it to happen because it's the very first thing that comes up. And time is going to elapse though. And so it's like, what do you want the result to be? Right. Do you want to have a good time or do you want to have a bad well, time? Well, you want to have a bad time. You can, you can manifest both. Yeah. I got off route. Uh, on something really stupid, so simple, in, uh, somewhere on Swan Slap. And, you know, it was easy climbing, but I got run out and off course, mm -hmm. you know, off route. And 
I don't know what it is, but my mind always goes to, I'm going to fall and right. I'm going to die. Uh, right. And you can, of course, but there's no use in thinking about it because you can give in and you can step off, but there's no point. Why would you do that? Well, you know, but also you've got to remember what risk is. And it's like, oh, people, you manage risk or you're taking risks and stuff like that. So like, look, you know, if the climb is really easy for the first hundred feet you're not taking any risk mm -hmm. maybe there's a crux up there somewhere now you're taking the risk but if you manage the risk I mean one that you know you can climb that standard two that you have gear that you can place for protection even if you have to take a run out three that if you are run out the climbing is below your hard level so you should be able to do it in an automatic manner mm -hmm. even if you're off route three that you recognize when you're off route much sooner and how to turn around and come back down again. So before you even get to the risk, because suddenly now you're 40 feet out and you're gonna hit ledges, you, you set yourself into a situation of risk that you should have through managing seen well before you got there or as soon as you were there, had enough foresight to uh, figure out how you were going to back off of it well before you were there, like days, months before. Like if I ever get in this situation where I'm off route and I got to leave a piece, I'm going to try to get a sling around a tree and pull everything out and then pull that through and I'm going to go the right way. But when you suddenly find yourself in this situation where now you're at the point of risk, it's only 5-5, five, five, but if you blow it here, you're taking a big ride. So that's the risk. And you should be a good enough judge of climbing that it's like you look up, you look where you're at, you look, remember where you've come from, you go, it doesn't look any harder than it's already been. Mm -hmm. In fact, I can see the sequence to get me out of here. All I have to do is execute now. The first feelings are fine, but they're not necessarily valid. Yeah. So you're not going to die. Ideally. Not going to take that ride because you're good to go. And if you really don't think you can do it, you're going to be able to down climb where you're from and, or get some pro in and, and back off. You know, the last piece of pro, you're like, I'm putting this in here in case I can't do this. Shit. Come back down. I've done stuff where I've been completely off route. I'm looking, I'm like, well, it doesn't look any harder than what I've done and where I'm at. So I guess I can just keep doing this thing. The, the concept that you are taking a risk when you're climbing comes down to a lot of different uh, factors. Of, as to what that risk is easy climbing run out hard climbing everything's tight mm. you know uh soloing definitely no no margin for error but solo within your uh, abilities and and figure out how to solo before you actually solo there's a bunch of ways of you know leading a climb out yeah taking taking calculated risks yes knowing yourself yeah and knowing not getting in over perform. your head not being stupid yeah so it gets down to that performance. You just need to have confidence in yourself whenever you're performing anything that you, you got this. When you let the doubt in there, you've already lost that. What do you think? Should we go get some lunch soon? Yeah, sounds like a plan. <laughs> but uh, I think that what you're doing is Hands awesome. up in lights. Is this, did you just realize? <laughs> no, I, I saw it, but I'm just like uh, adding that. Yeah. Where can people... Go into Check a van stuff. and your name's on lights, in lights. Uh, well, I, uh, I have two, two websites. One is stonenudes.com and then the other, my Instagram is Pictures of Fidelman, which is actually a, a book by Bernard Malmud. I hope I pronounced his last name correct, who was an American author from the 30s, 40s, and 50s, 40s, and 50s, 60s. He wrote The Natural. And he wrote this book in 1950 something, early, mid, mid to late 50s, which was actually a collection of short stories about this artist called Fidelman. And it's Pictures of the Fide, Pictures of Fidelman is the name of the book. And Fidelman was this uh, a New York Jew who wanted to become an art critic. So he moves to Italy to study a particular painter and ends up himself becoming a painter. And, uh, going through these trials and tribulations and ending up coming back to the United States in the late 50s and becoming a truck driver. And, and I read that book 20, 30 years ago now. This, this girlfriend I had at the time who we weren't getting along with anyway, she used to like to read. And so she came back from the library once and goes, here, chucks the book at me. He goes, I, I like the title. And I go, oh, 
Oh, me too. <laughs> I'm reading this book, right? By the end of the book, the relationship was over. <laughs> uh, that's how it goes. I was like, well, you should have read the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's wonderful. That's so the, that's going to be the next book coming out? That and that screenplay. Oh, we just got oh we'll save that for the next episode. Should, yeah, that's, Ooh, uh, that's, that's going to be fun. exciting. <laughs> <laughs> be prepared. Yeah. Uh, like a steampunk Yosemite fairy tale. It has centers around climbing or steampunk U70 climbing fairy tale. I know something like that, but y you can figure it's going to be weird coming out of me. <laughs> and there'll what? probably be nudity in adult <laughs> situations throughout. <laughs> <laughs> Dean, thank you so much. Yeah. We'll have you back because we got to hear more. Excellent. All right. Glad to be here and I'm going to be psyched to come back. All right. Let's go make something. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs>